Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich, also starring John Comer. You're ready, Hollywood, because you're on trial. All rise. Who is now in session? The Honorable Judge Fudge presiding. This is on trial, and tonight I am your prosecuting attorney, your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. And this evening's uh, subject for prosecution and defense, Tim Burton's 2001 Planet of the Apes. Because as you may know, you've been paying attention this week, this is the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network Goes Ape Shit Week. (laughs) We reviewed the war for the Planet of the Apes, and so everything is Planet of the Apes this week. And we will top it off with I look at this this body of nonsense. Uh, joining me tonight, as always, is my co-host, Mr. Sean Comer. How do you do, sir? I feel half like crap, and I swear I could legitimately hate you for picking this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I specifically did not refer to you I did not say Sean Comer for the defense because you always have some <laughs> funny line. So I was prepared for that. And I specifically didn't say it because I was, I was waiting for you to go, Judge, whatever, blah, 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 for the defense, your honor, or your holiness, or your worshipness, or whatever it is you call me. I, I, just, I, I got nothing this time because I watched this movie two or three times just to try to come up with something that I could say about it. And... I just I, I, I couldn't come up with enough to fill a ninety minute show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, uh, well, I, I feel like what we should have done instead was I mean we we could have actually done a rather interesting show wherein we just sat and talked about um, kind of assessed the Planet of the Apes remakes that were pitched and didn't happen before this mm-hmm. one because some of them sound sound slightly better some of them sound laughably worse but i say laughably worse in the sense of i could watch this and just let my jaw drop in amazement that somebody sa- thought this was a good idea <laughs> this is th- th- this isn't even a laughably bad tim burton movie It's it's just like it's the one that we should start pointing to when we want to tell Hollywood we want to kind of you know grab the puppy by by its snoot and rub its nose in the pee puddle and say you see this you see this this is when it started going wrong <laughs> this is when you should have stopped because I mean. We were talking in the lead-up before the show about how the big problem with Tim Burton is that he's limited to being a spectacular visual director. Uh, he, he would have been a great director of photography or cinematographer or, or, or even – I almost want to say or even a serviceable special effects advisor, but – it's like every time he wants to adapt something, it's like he has this nifty idea in his head that he thinks will make whatever it is he's trying to adapt, quote, better. And his idea ultimately just ends up missing the entire point of why people love the original in the first place. It, it's like almost every Christian rock band you've ever heard 
that is just desperately trying to ape whatever the popular sound is at the time. But 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 it's so painfully, uh, egregiously obvious that they've just completely lost the plot. They have no idea why people actually like the real thing. I think Tim Burton kind of reminds me of George Lucas, who's so fixated on the visuals, but he doesn't seem to understand how human beings work. And uh, the, look, some of the some of, I was looking at his list of movies right before we started tonight. He's told some really interesting stories and he's and as you said with with a lot of the remakes he didn't he didn't seem to understand what the appeal was he just seemed to think he seemed to look at the original and go well i can do it better and then he gives you this fantastic looking thing normally but the story and the acting and the johnny depping it it all sucks it all makes for a giant headache. And, I, and and to this day, I will never forgive him for Batman Returns. I still think, I, and, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on this, but thinking back to our Long Road to Ruin episode, I'm still convinced Batman Returns is the worst of those four movies. At least, at least Batman and Robin was fun and colorful. As opposed to <laughs> Batman Re- as opposed to Batman Returns, which was bleak and disgusting at times. Well, you see, in my opinion, the the so-called good Tim Burton movies they they have they have one of two elements in common. Either a Burton was not the driving creative force behind it. Uh, like everybody, obviously, it's right there in the title: Tim Burton's A Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, the thing is, though, it was directed by Henry Selleck. So, as far as I'm concerned, that's his baby. Um, but the other, but the other element is sometimes he happens to get lucky. Uh, like he has, he has just the right casting or just the right visuals that it ends up being extremely memorable and just infectiously likable. Uh, well, like, okay, you want to talk about the Batman movies. My opinion, Burton deserves minimal credit for the first Batman movie actually being good. And the lion's share of it, the vast majority, uh, should go to Sam Hamm for writing a dynamite script, uh, Danny Elfman for composing one of the all-time great cinematic scores, Michael Keaton for being a better Batman than he had any right being, given his pedigree up to that point, and Jack Nicholson being considered everybody's quintessential Joker until right up until Mark Hamill came along. Um, those are the biggest reasons that movie, that movie was good. Um, it's okay... It just would it just wouldn't be a Rodlich and broadcasting show if we didn't make a professional wrestling comparison. Um, Everybody drink. He's been. He, he yeah. Um, in fact, I'm going to pour my scotch right now. Um, some of y'all motherfuckers think I'm joking. No, I have my Glenlivet right in front of me. Um, no, uh, it, it's like how some people will still try to defend Vince Russo by giving him credit for the Attitude Era. Well. No. Uh, he had a lot of off-the-wall ideas that he pitched, and you had Vince McMahon there who had the horse sense to be able to kind of, fil- kind of filter out uh, the actual viable ones and the game-changing ones from the dog shit. And the difference maker was obviously, well, then he went to WCW. He was given total free reign, and... Well, a couple years later, all of a sudden, there wasn't a WCW anymore. (laughs) But this one, though, what do you think? I I mean, production-wise, should I just start by just kind of going over the cliff notes of some of the ideas that were pitched before this one? Sure. Hit it. Okay, because again, I, I think these are far more interesting. Um, development of a new Planet of the Apes, 
goes clear back to the late 1980s when 20th Century Fox brought in Adam Rifkin and allowed him to pitch an idea of doing more of a lower budget, independent, uh, kind of more bare bones continuation of 1968's Planet of the Apes. Uh, when he was pitching it, he did what he could to kind of compare it to making it Aliens. Um, in fact, what he really wanted to do was he didn't want to do a sequel to the fifth Planet of the Apes movies, but he wanted to do an alternate sequel to the first one, uh, one that was very influ- influenced by Spartacus in which uh, the Empire of the Apes had advanced to its equivalent to like the Roman era and a descendant of Charlton Heston's character would be the one to head up the slave revolt against this you know, totalitarian oppressive regime led by General Eisen. And basically he was making a sword and sandal a sword and sandal movie with monkeys. He was making Gladiator with chimps. Basically. Um and that would have been titled Return of the Planet of the Apes. It almost got into pre-production. Uh, Rick Baker, who ultimately ended up doing the prosthetic make makeup for this movie, uh, would have was brought on to you know design the makeup for that one. Uh, Danny Elfman, another Tim Burton favorite, was brought on to compose the score, and uh, no, they had no less than Tom Cruise and Charlie Sheen buying for the role of Duke, which back then, that was a huge goddamn deal to get those two. Um, But, of course, uh, as Rifkin himself put it, it all seemed too good to be true. I soon found out that it was. Uh, Days before it was supposed to begin pre-production, new studio execs came came on, that led to creative differences with Rifkin. Uh, He was commissioned to rewrite the script, and the project ended up entirely scrapped until uh, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh pitched an idea in which the apes would proceed through monkey renaissance. Uh Um, uh, The ape government, where you would have an ape government that was up in arms over these over these primate artworks and the humans would be set to revolt and there would be a liberal contingent of apes that would um, shelter this half-human, half-ape from the gorillas. Um, It it really got Roddy McDowell's attention and he wanted to play what's described as a Leonardo da Vinci type character uh, that had been written especially for him. Um... However, Jackson was unfortunate enough to pitch it to an executive who really didn't like the series at all. Uh, He had no idea how important McDowell had been to the series, and so Jackson meandered off to go make Heavenly Creatures. Um, My personal favorite that I read about had to be this one involving Oliver Stone. Strap in any time you hear that name. Uh... (laughs) In 1993, uh, he and Sam Raimi were being considered by Fox as possible as possible directors, um, <clears throat> and eventually, uh, Stone was brought on as a co-writer and executive producer with a one million dollar salary. Um, and he, here's his quote describe, <laughs> describing his idea for the script. It has the discovery of cryogenically frozen Vedic apes who hold the secret numeric codes to the Bible that foretold the end of civilization. It deals with past versus the future. My concept is that there's a code inscribed in the Bible that predicts all historical events. The apes were there at the beginning and figured it all out. So he managed to make... A Planet of the Apes conspiracy thriller. Mark, Mr. Boom Heavyweight, I want you to sit there with a straight face and tell me you wouldn't pay to see that. 
I, I can't. I, I'm not, I mean, I, I absolutely would have gone to – I would have been there opening night. <laughs> God damn it, it's not fair that this movie doesn't exist. Um, and ultimately what we got, uh, he brought on Terry Hayes to write the screenplay. Um, here's the Wikipedia version of it, uh, pretty much word for word. Set in the near future, a plague is making humans extinct. Geneticist Will Robinson discovers the plague is a genetic time bomb embedded in the Stone Age. He time travels with a pregnant colleague named Billy Ray Diamond to a time when Paleolithic humans were at war for the future of the planet with highly evolved apes. The ape's supreme commander is a gorilla named Drac. Robinson and Billy Ray discover a young human girl named Eve, for some reason spelled A-I-V, to be the next step in evolution. It's revealed that it was the apes that created the virus to destroy the human apes. They protect her from the virus, thus ensuring the survival of the human race 102,000 years later, at which time Eve gives birth to a baby boy named Go Ahead. Guess. Caesar? Adam. Oh, because, okay. of course, um, making this even more fun, <laughs> um, at one point, Arnold Schwarzenegger was signed on to play with Robinson. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, Arnie was going to play a geneticist. Don't, <laughs> don't any of you ever say a fucking word about Tara Reid playing an archaeologist ever again. Um, long story short... Um, Pre-production eventually con- commenced with a $100 million budget. Um, uh, they approached Rick Baker again to design the prosthetic makeup, but they eventually went with Stan Winston instead. But uh, Fox wasn't crazy about the idea between what they considered an ideal approach and how Hayes interpreted Stone's ideas. Um, so... as uh, producer Terry Murphy was qu- or Don Murphy was quoted as saying, "Terry wrote a Terminator, and Fox wanted the Flintstones." <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Fox Studio exec Dylan Sellers wanted the script to be funnier. Um, he proposed, "What if Robinson finds himself in Ape Land, and the apes are trying to play baseball, but they're missing one element, like the pitcher or something?" Yeah, that was my favorite part. That this movie does not exist proves that there is no God. <laughs> when all this fell apart, eventually, um, uh, director Philip Noyce departed from the project, and he wandered off in 1995 to go make The Saint, because that was a much wiser life choice. And the final one, I'll, the final one I'll talk about here. Um, is the what was going to be a collaboration between Chris Columbus, uh, he of home of most notably, I believe, Home Alone and Harry Potter fame, and uh, James Cameron. Um, so, at this point, Fox was performing tests of apes skiing for some reason according to what few notes on this I could find. (laughs) Stan Winston was still working on the makeup. Columbus brought Sam Hamm on board, um, who had had previously co-written the famous unproduced Fantastic Four script um, to to write the screenplay. Um, they wanted to pretty much write an homage from everything they liked from the original five movies and incorporate a bunch more material from Pierre Boulez's uh, original novel that had been left out of the early productions. Um, and this one's main plot featured an ape astronaut, um, an interstellar ape astronaut, crash landing in New York Harbor, 
Uh, he sets off a virus that will bring the human that b- will bring human beings to the brink of extinction. Um, a Centers for Disease Control and Prevent and Prevention uh, researcher and an Area 51 scientist use the demolished spacecraft to return to the virus's or- planet of origin in search of an antidote where they find apes living in an urban environment armed with heavy weapons and hunting humans. Uh, main villain was going to be Lord Zaius. Um, instead of Dr. Zaius, he was going to be perpetually cruel to humans. Um, the two discover the antidote, come back to Earth, and they discover that in their 74-year absence, the apes have taken over. Um They've chiseled the face of the Statue of Liberty, of Liberty into a big grinning ape. Again, things I hate that I never got to see. Um, at this point, Schwarzenegger was still attached. Um, when Columbus dropped out in late 1995 to go make Jingle All the Way, um, Fox first offered the director's chair to Roland Emmerich, uh, in January '96, James Cameron was uh, filming Titanic at uh, when he kind of came to talks to come on board as writer and producer. Uh, his version would have taken a lot more from the original film and beneath the Planet of the Apes. Um, but after Titanic hit it big, uh, he of course dropped out entirely. Um, uh, they briefly went back and reconsidered the Renaissance idea. Uh, Jackson didn't, Peter Jackson no longer wanted to direct, wanted to direct as long as Schwarzenegger and Cameron were involved. Were involved. Um, Schwarzenegger skedaddled to go work on Eraser. Michael Bay passed up directing, trying to decide if that was if that was ultimately for the best. Um, Jackson turned it down. Again, because basically he was put to a choice between Planet of the Apes and this silly three-movie series about little people walking around New Zealand. Um, because he really he kind of lost a lot of his enthusiasm after uh, the death of Roddy McDowell. Um, Mid-99, the Hughes brothers were at one point interested, but they buggered off to go because they committed to make From Hell. And since I really don't have a whole lot to say about the actual production of the movie, that's, in my opinion, the far more interesting story of the movies I wish we would have gotten to watch while making, while making this show. Because, goddamn, monkey renaissance, monkey <laughs> espionage, Holy shit, how do these not exist? How has nobody picked up these balls and run with them? I mean, you, you got to think someone at at least the asylum would have a hankering <laughs> to make to make make a mockbuster of this. I I mean, you you tell me, Mark, uh, of those, which of those was your favorite? Which one would you have probably most enjoyed? Oh, honestly, I mean, I, I read a lot of that stuff uh, the other day, and I got to the part about, like, wouldn't it be funny if the if the apes were playing baseball, but something's wrong with it, like the pitch, and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> not, not that it's a good idea, but it's so stupid. And so not the point. <laughs> I feel like that should have been, like, an offshoot of Air Bud. <laughs> But, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, do don't you? I'm the I'm the one sitting here with the brown liquor. Don't you start falling asleep, motherfucker? <laughs> I'm I'm here. I am wide awake and invested here. Um, all right. If, if there's nothing more, then uh, let's get into the flop synopsis and the let's put this thing on trial, uh, such as it is. Uh. So. 
In 2029, aboard the U.S. Air Force Space Station Oberon, Leo Davidson is played by Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg, uh, works closely with primates who are trained for space missions. His favorite simian co-worker is a chimpanzee named Pericles. With a deadly electric, electromagnetic magnetic storm approaching the station, a small space pod piloted by Pericles is used to probe the storm. Uh, Pericles' Pericles's pod heads into the storm and disappears. Uh, there's this whole like minor mini subplot where Mark Wahlberg is a Air Force pilot. And he wants to be the one to fly out there, and they were like, no, it's too dangerous. That's why we send the chimps. But Pericles disappears, and he goes after him. In doing so, he is projected several thousand years into the future to the year 5021 and lands on Aslar. What he comes to find out is that uh, humans who are not mute <laughs> but seem, you know, v- vaguely savage, I guess. Basically, it, they, they, they're, they're walking, talking cave people um, who <laughs> honestly, I don't want to get off on a, tan- on a Winfrey-like tangent here, but I don't see, you know, the, in the original, they were mute, savage-like humans, you know, who, who were beastly. I have the foggiest fucking clue why these humans uh, couldn't take the apes out, but whatever. Um, They can't. Uh, So he lands on this planet, and immediately he is overrun by apes who are uh, attacking humans and bringing them back to the city to uh, be sold into slavery. Here is where we meet the uh, Helena Bottom, Bottom Carter character who is a sympathizer for humans and believes they can be more. Uh, And so she buys Mark Wahlberg and the human love interest in this thing, such as she is. And boy, are we going to talk about her, Uh, Dana. Uh, She buys them both and brings them to her home. Um, After a guess, after a kind of guess who's coming to dinner or, uh, oh gosh, white man's burden-esque type dinner where uh, the apes are are essentially talking about uh, the humans like you you would if you had, you know, a bunch of rich white people talking about black folks or in the case of white man's burden where they reversed it with the black folks talking about the white folks. They have that kind of a dinner. Uh, Mark Wahlberg and company escape. Um, there's a couple of characters that end up going with them. Uh, we learn about the uh, the mythology of the apes. We learn about Simos, who is the first ape and is the ape god, and he is the one that sets civilization for the apes in motion. Uh, at this point, they are off on a journey. First thing they do is they need to find his ship, which crashed into the water. Um, this is also where we catch up again with Paul Giamatti's character, who is the slave driver, uh, and they end up like, basically taking him hostage. In any case, he dives into his ship, and he pulls out essentially a radio uh, so that he can try to contact his colleagues. And as it turns out, uh, it, he does contact the Oberon, so they make for the Oberon. And when they get there, they realize that uh, it has crashed and has been crashed for several years now. Um, and he, uh, he is overwhelmed by guilt because he realizes that by, by going after Pericles and flying into the electromagnetic storm, he caused the destruction of his, uh, of the Oberon and the good folks that were on it because they went after him as well. And in doing so, they crashed on Aslar many years prior. They did not get thrown forward in, in time. Uh, Simos and the apes that landed with them uh, eventually overcame the humans and killed them and went on to create uh, ape civilization. Now, um, earlier in the film, we met a character played by Tim Ross named General Thade. He hates humans, and he is trying to manipulate the Senate to give him full power to take out every human that he sees. Because it's a dicey subject, apparently. Uh, he eventually gets it because he convinces a senator that the humans kidnapped 
uh, Helena Bonham Carter when she went with them willingly, basically. So anyway, so he, he puts together the army, and, the, and he goes after them. Uh, this all ends at the Oberon. All a, bu- a bunch of humans show up, the apes show up, and we have our final showdown. Uh, then in the middle of them having this showdown, Pericles finally shows up, and Markle Oberg says something truly confusing. Let's go teach the, these apes about evolution. They proceed to walk into the Oberon. General Day says, I've had enough of this shit. And, he, <laughs> and as Pericles goes running off to go, go into his cage, um, they attack Mark Wahlberg again. There's a struggle. They fight, fight, fight. Eventually, Mark Wahlberg loses his gun. They picks it up. And before he can shoot him, Mark Wahlberg lowers a, uh, a, a glass door. Um, and Sade is not able to get them, and he shoots at it, and apparently he shoots at it enough and causes enough sparks that he scares the shit out of himself, and he hides underneath the desk for the remainder of the film. We'll talk about that in a moment. So uh, it ends with uh, Pericles is severely injured in this whole scuffle. He gives the Pericles over to Helena Bottom Carter. Uh, he gets in Pericles' ship, and he takes off, and he lands on Earth, uh, he crash lands at the Lincoln Memorial, but as it turns out, and 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 look, I'm just gonna go ahead and and, and say what Tim Burton said about this. This ending doesn't make any sense. It's not supposed to. It was going to get. Exp- it was possibly going to get explained in later sequels. But basically, and I and I and I want to add in some other comments here. I, I want to say to Lena Bonham Carter, who says that Sade somehow got to Earth before. Um, well before, like decades before, um, Leo makes it home, and he is able to cause an ape uprising. He becomes ape Abraham Lincoln, thus he's in the Abra- in the Lincoln Memorial, and now the whole now the whole of Earth, present day Earth, has been overrun with civilized apes. We've got ape cops, ape reporters, ape children, the whole nine yards. And Mark Wahlberg stands there looking confused, as was the rest of the audience who saw this thing. So with that said, that's our movie, such as it is. I'm going to go ahead and begin my prosecution of this nonsense. I'm not going to talk about the ending. Thank you. The, ending is so, the ending is so stupid that and it, it, it kind of like, this is kind of like um, the Deadpool thing from Wolverine, uh, X-Men Origins. It, it's sort of easy. It, it's low-hanging fruit. It's easy pickings. Uh, it's the thing that everybody cites. So I'm going to put that aside because there were far more egregious sins in the creation of this picture than the stupid ending. So let's not even talk about it. Let's talk about why we go see Tim Burton films for a moment. As, as Sean and I talked about earlier, we go to see Tim Burton films not because of the well put together stories, because half of them are shit stories to begin with. But we tolerate the shit stories because what Tim Burton has successfully done in the past and failed to do for this movie is create otherworldly, beautiful, breathtaking visuals. There was an opportunity, and and this really should have been the star of Planet of the Apes 2001. This should have been the big drawing card, and an opportunity was, was sorely missed here. The ball was dropped. When you think Tim Burton is going to remake Planet of the Apes, the first thing that should come to everyone's mind is, the monkey city, the ape city, is going to look awesome. It's going to look amazing. I mean, think about just a couple of his movies. Um, Alice, Alice in Wonderland, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, both remakes. And as we said before, his track record with remakes, not so good. But visually, Alice in Wonderland and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory look amazing, look otherworldly. They're exactly why you would go see a Tim Burton movie. 
and he utterly fails to create anything visually stimulating in this movie. This movie is bland. It's almost monochromatic, and everything is like beige and earth tones, but not like in an interesting way either. It's just boring to look at. The city itself, not enough time is spent there, number one, to really draw you into this world. You know, just as soon as they get there, you have this elongated white man's burden scene, and then they're escaping again, and they're in a tunnel. But even as the slave cart is rolling through the city and you're getting to see apes playing instruments and apes playing basketball and whatnot, it's all blah. It's all just kind of meh. There's nothing fun about the city. There was no imagination in the creation of this set piece. And then the whole rest of the movie takes place in the desert. I am reminded of Stan Kinison now. You live in a desert. There's no food there. Well, there's nothing interesting to look at either. You know, let's, let's talk about some movies that take place in deserts. Let's talk about A New Hope for a moment. So you have this, you have the, the droids that land in the desert, and there's quick cuts away from them before you, you start to lose interest in what you're looking at. But even, even at the parts that focus on the droids, there's a dead dragon in the background. Um, you know, there isn't too... You're not, you're not with any one, either one of the droids, let's get they split up, too long to where you're looking at boring scenery. Um, not too long after that, R2-D2 is in, is in the Jawa tank cart thing, and then they're on the farm. And then, you know, it's just, just the plot's moving along, and the scenery doesn't matter as much. Stuff is happening that keeps it all very interesting. And you have some really good performances. And you've got, you know, Sir Alex Guinness, who's telling you all these wonderful things about the Force and about Luke's father and all that stuff. So the fact that it takes place in a boring-looking desert doesn't matter as much. Now, let's compare that to Planet of the Apes, where the whole thing takes place in a fucking desert, and there's nothing interesting happening. It's just Helena Bonham Carter talking to Mark Wahlberg, and they're debating the they're debating whether or not humans really put apes in cages. That was that was a fun bit of dialogue. No, it wasn't. And you know, there's some you know Paul Giamatti, Paul Giamatti makes some wisecracks. And my favorite part about those entire sequences, which take up at least two thirds of the movie, is this yacht. And I haven't even gotten to performances yet. But Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Estella Warren as the blank staring Dana. Whoo! I don't know where they. I don't know what strip club they pulled this one out of, but she couldn't act her way out of a paper bag, which is probably good since all they gave her to do was stare blankly at Mark Wahlberg just stare blankly into the camera. And she has a couple of lines of dialogue delivered, you know, like she's just reading them off the page. And then that's it. I'll come back to some of the cast in in, in just a moment. But in any case, so you have boring discussion, boring walking, one character who anytime they put the camera on her is just staring off into deep space for some odd reason. And then we finally get to the we finally get to the exciting conclusion, the big fight between the ape army and the humans. Now, we're going to transition out of talking about how this movie looks. Suffice it to say, it looks kind of like shit, basically. Um, it looks boring. There's nothing interesting about these set pieces. But at least you have a exciting Battle of Helm's Deep, uh, Battle of Pelennor Field, you know, even something out of a Star Wars prequel, you know, with Jedis and cockroaches fighting each other. Now, here is where Mark Wahlberg needed to be directed to step up, and here's where the dialogue should have picked up. 
this is where once he realizes there's no getting off this planet, and he, you know he's got it, and, and the humans are looking to him as he is the one who dares stand up to the apes. This is where he needed to go all Braveheart. This is where he needed to rally the humans and say, whatever happens today, we you know we will fight the apes. And whether we win or lose, we will go down fighting. You know, this needs to be Aragorn's speech. It would take the heart of me. Instead, you have him first. Like, I don't know why everyone's looking at me. <laughs> wow, okay. And then after he's kind of, sort of, maybe convinced to fight, it's still just more like, it, it comes across almost like an A-team plan. <laughs> and all you knew is get behind the overall. You go over there. You're going to be safe. I'm going to go ahead and set this fuel tank to blow up so that it takes off, you know, maybe one fifth of the army. That way it'll even the score. Sure. I mean, again, another missed opportunity to create real drama between the humans and the apes. You know, instead of focusing so much on that journey, there really should have been a sequence where Mark Wahlberg, and again, I, I go back to, you know, who did it right? Peter Jackson in the Battle of Helm's Seat. You know, there, there's this moment where Aragorn and uh, Legolas are talking about how they're outnumbered and, you know, all the orcs in the world are going to ride right down on them, you know, and these are not soldiers. These, these are farmers and they're frightened. You know, and Aragorn's like, this is their home. There's no other option but to fight. And you see them armoring up, you know, and all of that, and you get, you're invested in these characters. I don't want to fuck about these humans, okay? I did not care. There's nothing in the movie that gives me a reason to care other than the plot says so, and that's not good enough. It's so bad. You're just, you know, and so there's nothing interesting about this fight because you don't care about the humans. You kind of don't care about the aches. And then the whole thing you shot in a cloud of dust. That was the other fun part of it. It's just, there's a fight going on, and they're kicking up so much dust. Some of it's even hard to see. And then Pericles lands. And this is my favorite thing. I mentioned it before in the plot synopsis. Suddenly all the fighting stops. Now, I get why the fighting stops, and that's fine. I was kind of sold on the idea of our God has returned to us. Um, fine. I, I, I get the return of Monkey Jesus. Fine. But then they don't do anything with it. It's just an opportunity. It's just a reason for all the humans who are just kind of standing around jerking off to stop fighting with the apes who then just stand around and jerk off. Um, and my favorite part of that whole sequence is he sees Pericles. He's like, hey, you're back. Yay. And then for some odd reason, and, and maybe in Sean's defense, he can explain it to me because I didn't get it. He takes Pericles by the hand and decides they're going to go into the Oberon. Why are they going to fly away? The Oberon is destroyed. Why are they going into the Oberon? And then he says this great line, you know, let's go to these apes about evolution. Is Pericles going to show you? Is, is Pericles going to show you into the secret cabinet of the Oberon that has the machine gun? What the fuck does that even mean? Let's teach these. Let's teach these apes about evolution. Does Pericles know where the secret weapon stash is? I don't understand what's happening in this movie. <laughs> and the only and the only character who has makes any sense at all is Fade. It's like, why does the movie stop? It would have been better if he actually had looked at the camera and said, I don't understand what's happening here. All I know is I still hate that. I still hate Mark Wahlberg. And then he jumps on him like he does. No. Uh, let, let, let's quick talk about some of these performances. And let's talk about the award-winning costume design. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know Rick Baker won a BAFTA award. I know that a lot of the critics said, well, at least it looks nice. Even Sean said this looks like a, this looks like a beautiful movie when you're talking, I guess, exclusively about the 
costume design. Sade looks great. You know, I don't want to undermine my own argument here, but, you know, Sade looks good. Helena Bottom Carter doesn't look bad. All the gorillas look like they're wearing, wearing gorilla suits. They do. They, those are the most unconvincing costumes I've ever seen. I, it looked to me, I, I, they look laughable. You know, my wife, who uh, doesn't watch a lot of these things, came out, you know, came out a couple of times and saw what I was watching, and she was like, what's with all the, goro- <laughs> what's with all the gorilla suits? <laughs> which compared to this, which compared to Sade was like, would you spend all your budget on Sade? And then it was like, quick, Ralph, go to this costume store and buy a bunch of gorilla suits. You know, go buy something from Bonzo Goes Bananas because we got to dress up Michael Clark Duncan. And they look terrible. They look so fake. It, it, it is unreal. And that is, again, so unfortunate in a Tim Burton movie where costume design is almost as important as visual uh, set design. But I want to I want to get into the performances here. Mark Wahlberg is as flat and as adequate as always, which doesn't make for a very interesting film, and it's not an interesting film. Helena Bottom Carter was an interesting character. She's one of the few interesting characters in the movie, but does, delivers half her dialogue in a half mumble, half sigh to the point where she is nigh understandable. Michael Clark Duncan is fine. He's Michael Clark Duncan in a gorilla costume. Uh, I've already mentioned Stella Warren, who might possibly be the worst actress I've ever seen. She's fucking terrible. Chris Christopherson is utterly wasted. I, he's like, I want to be in this movie. Okay. We'll just, you know, he... <laughs> He's the George Clooney in South Park of this movie. He's just, he's just there to get killed. George Clooney played a dog who barks. That's it. Don't be weird. Don't be gay, Sparky. Don't be gay. Um, and Paul Giamatti. <coughs> Paul Giamatti's pretty funny. Heracles also did a fine job. <laughs> Good old Jonah the Chip. In conclusion, for now, it looks terrible. The costumes are uneven, the performances are uneven, and the plot is, is, runs the gamut of boring to nonsensical. This thing is a giant mess. And I don't know how, after watching dailies, any of the producers let this thing go to the theaters and didn't stop it. Uh, or, or make some changes. It's like, are you afraid of Tim Burton? Do you think he's going to bite you? You know, or is it just like, oh, well, we think everything Tim Burton is great and have no discernible opinions about anything. This is a failure in every way of production. The adults weren't watching the store, and ultimately what you got was almost like a Tim Burton film that in the middle, Tim Burton didn't want to make anymore. And for more on that, check out our review of Michael Bay's Transformers The Last Night, in which we say the same thing about Michael Bay, that about halfway through the movie, I don't think he wanted to make this movie anymore. And it shows. Your witness. Thank you, my tallest. Folks, I don't consider myself a religious person, but I do consider myself a spiritual one. And um, specifically, I hold a very strong belief in what's known as the law of attraction, which at its most basic explanation explains that that which – everything is attracted to that which is its like counterpart. Now, there's another part of that law that's also important to remember. Yes, it does posit that thoughts become things. And hence, there's a notion that we should all try to remain in as positive a mindset as possible and always remain focused on the things we want, don't devote our attention to the things that we don't want. But there's another important approach to it. It's a more realistic one. It's the idea that it sometimes pays to experience bad things. 
That's because sometimes the bad things that we experience end up bringing the things that we actually want, that will actually make us happy, into ever sharper relief. So in that sense, that's one of the reasons why it's actually a good thing that this movie exists. Let's, uh, let's juxtapose this with a much better set of takes on, oh, let's face it, the exact same idea, the idea of building upon the legacy of Planet of the Apes. So along came Tim Burton, and he made this dog shit version of what was an otherwise great movie. Just entirely missed the point. You know, Rifkin actually had the right idea. Make more of an independent, realistically budgeted, independent movie with a reasonably simple story that would still be entertaining. No, 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 no. Not our Timmy. No, <laughs> fuckity fuck no. No. He wanted to go all out and make his usual movie magic bukkake. And we, the audience, were supposed to just sit there, kneel politely, smile, and just say, please don't get it in the eye. And, uh, yeah, we saw how that went, didn't we? He ended up making a complex clusterfuck with the elements of the stupid time travel idea that some goddamn how almost got made. Well, evidently, 20th Century Fox was paying attention. And so, after a 10-year coma, eventually, the Planet of the Apes rose again. Aha, you see what I did there? And this time, with uh, Rupert Wyatt at the helm directing what was, granted, also very serious, but it's a serious take on the story, but it was an origin story that kept things much, much simpler in terms of the plot, in terms of the stakes, in terms of the conflict. It managed to not go too far in a pretentious direction but did indeed successfully set up not just one, but two critically acclaimed sequels. So, you have that. <laughs> we, we experienced something terrible, and it showed us what we needed to be happy with this scenario that we desired, which was more Planet of the Apes movies. Along the way, incidentally, further proof that things happen for a reason and that the universe wants us all to prosper. Mark Wahlberg actually did the world a service with this movie. Number one, during production, he refused to wear a loincloth as he was supposed to during one scene. You're welcome. World, Mark actually knew when to stop, and that was stopping at showing the world his funky bunch. We had seen enough of the funky bunch. In addition to that, it was a trade off, it was a zero sum game for this, for him. He could either go along with Tim Burton and make this grandiose remake of Planet of the Apes. Or, or, <laughs> he could go along with this cockamamie idea of getting, to, getting together with a bunch of other highly sought-after actors, making a remake of some mediocre 60s Rat Pack movie. Because who wants to go and do that? You know, no way that's going to get a sequel. I mean, of the two of them, which one do you think is going to generate 
two spin-offs and then an all females not rather two sequels and then an all female spin off. You know, which one do you think is gonna do that? Ocean's Eleven, oh, can't tell what that's supposed to be about from the title. Or Planet of the Apes, which is very plainly a movie about interstellar monkeys. One very clearly has got legs, the other does not. So, Mark Wahlberg, he told Steven Soderbergh, said, so long, my good man. I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have to leave Vegas. Uh, here, here's the number of my good buddy, Matt Damon. You give him a call. He'll hook you up for your, for your little fancy schmancy heist movie. <laughs> good luck with that. So, again, things happening for a reason. We got good things out of this. Number one, we had the right leading man in charge so that we didn't have to look at the leading man's dick at any point. Number two, he stepped out of what ultimately actually ended up being a good movie, and we got a kind of, sort of, sometimes moderately better actor in there. Good for him. And again, I stress, I think this had to be bad in order for Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and War for the Planet of the Apes to be as great as they were. Everything from the plot to, you know, when you really look at it, had it not been for this, would it have been as clear what we really needed from Andy Serkis to really carry off a much better leading ape in his trio of movies. I mean, granted, it's Andy fucking Circus. He probably would have been brilliant anyway. But it brought it into sharper relief. And I believe that on some level it had to have served as some kind of motivation for... Rupert Wyatt and James Franco and Frida Pinto and John Lithgow and Brian Cox, Tom Felton, David Oyelowo and Andy Serkis to all get together. Oh, and also, of course, writers Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver to all say, for the love of God, let's not fuck the dog like the weird-haired Batman guy. But that's all taking a look at the movie from a relative standpoint. It's kind of it's kind of looking at its place in history. Let's look a little more carefully, just for a moment, at this movie on its own merits. Actually, as a blockbuster, yeah, it's the drizzling shits. Clearly, somebody's mentally deficient cousin wrote this, and they should get the, they should still be lobbying to get their money back for it. But on the other hand, as a B-movie, it's actually kind of charming. I think the simple fact of the matter is you have to come in with your expectations fully intact. If you're, expect, if you're looking at the cast, and let's face facts, it is a pretty impressive top-to-bottom cast. You go in blockbuster of the year, the big star power front-loaded hit that's going to launch a brand new franchise. Because at the time, keep in mind, this was still back when Mark Wahlberg was still a fairly big deal before he was outrunning the wind and actually somehow making the giant robots make even less sense than they already did. And who did you have to serve against him as his antagonist? Tim fucking Roth. You know, the, the man that I personally loved watching in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. I was damned excited to see him play a monkey. You had Helena Bottom Carter, who... Actually, I'm just going to say that aside from the fact that, yeah, you can't understand a word she's saying half the time, 
wasn't bad. I mean, it proves that in the right role, she's actually tolerable. It's just that the problem is, for the most part, she's asked to play the same role time and again and again and again, and it's just a matter of sometimes taking that one character that she knows how to play and slotting it into just the right movie. You know, worked in Fight Club, worked in Harry Potter, kind of worked in um, um, Sweeney Todd. And it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad here. I mean, she could have maybe done with a little bit of ADR. But considering all the makeup she was being asked to act through, as were the rest of the cast, she really didn't do a half bad job working with what she had. The same, I think, goes for Michael Clark Duncan, who, rest his soul, was a joy to see in almost anything he was in. Paul Giamatti was fine in kind of an elder statesman sort of role. Estella Warren, uh, well, sometimes you cast. Schwarzenegger or Terry Crews, and sometimes, hey, Danny Elfman actually put together a pretty nice score, as he tends to. Uh, the cinematography, I thought, was I thought wasn't bad. So hats off to Philippe Rousselot for that. You know, I'll admit the the setting could have been more spectacular, but I think that comes back to trying to take this a little bit too seriously and trying to make it to make it you know too er, dark and grim and see I don't have to be all be all colorful and whimsical all the time Tim stick to what you know um but overall as a B movie goes it has its limited degrees of charm. It's riff worthy. I mean, it's it's that difference that I always talk about between watching fucking Sharknado and watching something like Planet of the Apes or The Room or Plan Nine from Outer from outer space. It's that notion that something is worthy of being laughed at and this is going to sound exceptionally cruel, only if it's somebody's sincere, level best effort to bring a creative vision they believed in to life. And that's one thing i got to say for Tim. He never wants for conviction in, in his vision of what something should be. It's just that so often what he wants is a stupid thing. And that's what this is. It's a gloriously stupid thing. While it does miss out on that notion of keeping things simple and being kind of charming for its simplicity that the original and even the better se- the better original sequels had, it still manages to try so excessively hard that it goes around the bend and manages to be amusing. In a way, it's almost like you have an opportunity to watch this movie and sort of form your own headcanon of what Mark Wahlberg really thought Pericles was going to teach him about evolution in that capsule. I mean, it's an excellent question. It, re- it really is. It deserves to rank up... the drink up there with who shot nice guy Eddie and who was lifting the briefcase up when Stone Cold Steve Austin was reaching for it. Everybody drink. Hang on. Thank you for the reminder. So my advice would be this movie and watch it at least once just to say that you saw it. Because once you've seen it, once you have 
rolled around in the badness, the way a dog rolls around in a strange brown steaming pile that it finds out in the field. It will have solidified for you also everything that is wonderful about the original series and the three legitimately, unironically outstanding prequels that we have just had bestowed upon us. The floor is yours. So I want to applaud Sean for doubling down on cockamamie arguments because not since my (laughs) argument for Catwoman have I heard (laughs) such believable nonsense. I applaud you, sir. None of that is insult. I I am amazed. (laughs) that you came up with that, and, and I almost want to concede. But, you know, the, the, the argument of, well, hey, we needed this terrible piece of shit so we could get something good. Yes, that's exactly how Hollywood operates. Listen, let's, let's spend $150 on this fucking dog shit so that in a few years we'll reboot the whole fucking thing again and we'll get something 80 times better. I love Look, you, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you just have to let Ang Lee direct Hulk. Oh God. Um, so, sometimes, way, like... sometimes, sometimes he has to make Big Green Monster beautiful haiku. <laughs> I watched the um, nostalgia critic review of that today, and I generally don't laugh at his stuff, so I'm amused by it. I laughed out loud at his, at his Ang Lee uh, Hulk review. But anyway, back to Planet of the Apes. The final, my final argument, you know, prosecute, defend, prosecutor as the last word. The last word is this. And uh, other than noting the cockamamie argument, Sean made the beautiful, beautiful <laughs> cockamamie argument. I, I can't go back over a lot of what he said, uh, but I can say this. Yeah, Tim Roth, was one of the few engaging high points of this movie, except that even him, they ruined. I mean, it's, this movie is so bad that nobody walks out of it unscathed and not looking terrible at some point. Tim Roth puts on, by far, the best performance in the entire movie. His general fade character is genuinely scary and menacing. You get where he's coming from, even if some of the, like, socio-political stuff, you know, like, we should declare martial law. Oh, you just know words and don't know what they mean, uh, screenwriter and <laughs> Tim Burton. Um, you know, it, it, it's right up there with, with the Star Wars prequel. We'll we vote of no confidence, and we're going to create an army. And, all right, George, you don't understand how government works either, but, but nonetheless. <laughs> despite, all, despite all of that, you get – I mean, he's a very simple character. He hates the humans. Now, it would have been nice if you got some background as to why he might hate the humans. Uh, considering he comes well after the humans have est- the apes have established a society, so I don't know what is motivating all this hatred. Screenwriting 101: Give your fucking villains adequate motivation. I don't need to. I don't need to see his entire backstory. I don't need General Fade the movie. If you're listening, Hollywood, I'm not asking for this. Please, I'm look. I know I'm the king of silly premises. And I'm always talking about the unpaid intern who takes my ideas and runs with them and creates sillier movies. But please, for the love of God, on this one time I am begging you, don't make General Fade the movie. I'm not asking for this. Um, however, Colonel Sanders versus the Green Lantern Corps, I am asking for. That looks fantastic. Um, Fuck you. No lie, there's... <laughs> there's, a, there's a comic book that's cur- of yes, KFC's Colonel Sanders and the Green Lantern Corps. Please, someone make that a movie. Um, anyway. Kiss the pale part of my ass, Rodelich. <laughs> um, but yes, General Fade the movie. I'm not asking for, but some minor details as to why he hates the humans so much would have been great. Because it isn't as like he he's kind of you know nonplussed. 
by the humans, and then Mark Wahlberg shows up and fucks his whole world up, which might have made for a better plot. Um, it's just, we just kind of open the movie, He Mark Wahlberg shows up, and he hates them. You know, and doesn't talk about why he hates them, he just does. And he wants to kill them all. He doesn't talk about why he wants to kill them all, or what's, you know, do the humans have resources that some of the apes need? Are they standing on valuable land? Do they, <laughs> what's happening in this world? No, we're too busy sending all the actors to monkey school. True story. They they wasted. Yeah. Tim Burton is a psychopath. They wasted money in the budget <laughs> to send the ape characters to monkey school to learn how to move <laughs> like actual monkeys. This is what they've spent time on instead of developing a plot or characters. But I digress. Even with, despite all of that, as far as just a movie monster villain type, you know, somebody who just wants, he just wants to kill the humans. Okay, I get it. I dig it. And we get to the end of the movie, and even, and even when Pericles lands and we have this stupid exchange between him and Mark Wahlberg, you know, and Sage's like, what the fuck are we all standing around for? Get him. And he jumps on Mark Wahlberg, and he gets the gun, and he's caressing the gun. And he's pointing, and he's like, I'm going to finally get you, you damn filthy human. And then Mark Wahlberg shuts the door, and he shoots at the door, and suddenly he's the dumbest character in the movie. Now, you could say, oh, he's blinded by rage. All right, I'll buy that. But then he, beca- but then he, he, he devolves into a scared chimp that hides under the desk from scary sparks. And never comes out again. Apparently, we're led to, we're led to believe that, you know, with the, with the coming of Pericles, uh, the humans and the apes learn to live together, and he just stays in the Oberon forever, jerk it off. I don't understand what's happening in this movie. But they, managed, but they managed to take the one solid character and ruin him. I mean, he's not even, like, summarily defeated as such. He just he shoots the door, freaks out, hides under the desk, and then you never see him again. There's, I mean, there should have been an after credit scene where he just comes out and just starts murdering humans left and right with the gun. <laughs> you, know? you know, or just goes completely crazy. and just like, you motherfuckers! And just starts shooting everybody. I was like, but why, say Bang! Something. No. Instead, you take this, like, sociopathic character and reduce him to the, the clown shoes. I, I said it before and I'll say it again. My, my final word on this entire affair is it was as if they laid out a list of things that needed to be in this movie and go, all right, well, how, well, we need a script. We need, we need a set. We need actors. And in one by one, they're like, how can we fuck every single one of these up? How can, how can we lay out such a disaster that nothing that we get nothing right? That even if it starts to be right, we're going to ruin it somehow. And the best example of that is the General Fade character played by poor, poor Tim Roth. You bastard. And the prosecution rests. I think we have uh, said more than enough about this movie. I, think no, I don't think more words have been spoken about this movie. <laughs> you know, people just want to forget it. It's look. It, it really is terrible. Bad. It, it is horrible. Um, it is. I had to really think about it before I went. Okay, what positives actually came out of this? Came out of this movie? And yeah, there were parts that I exaggerated, but I'm only about half kidding when I say. No, seriously, I truly believe that part of the reason the last three movies we got have been so good is because this served as an example of what not under any circumstances to do. Um, I mean, otherwise, it's just, it's even unremarkable by Tim Burton standards, and that is shocking. Yeah. It's the most boring yeah. movie to look at I've ever seen by somebody who's supposed to be a master of visuals. And it shouldn't be. It's about an alien planet of monkeys. 
<laughs> How did you, you fuck know, up Monkey Planet? What did you, know, you do thing, to like, Monkey Planet? That's why I really wish they had let him make Superman lives. I mean, they'd still be paying it off. Warner Brothers would still be paying it off, but <laughs> the budget was so damn high. <laughs> um, but I, I would have loved to have seen what he what he would have done with Brainiac and Brainiac's ship and everything. And I and I remember in the documentary about what happened to Superman Lives, uh, there was some test footage that was shown. And look, it would have been a shitty Superman movie, but it would have looked amazing. And I really wish it, it, it's one of those missed opportunities where, like, I'm no fan of Tim Burton. I consider him one of Hollywood's greatest monsters. <laughs> just, he's, I think he's a hack director, quite frankly. I, I you know I, what, uh, you know what, I truck Mark, you Tim know what Burton. I would propose? I, I got an, I got an idea. Um, I can figure out on my phone how to add somebody to a call. I think I know somebody that uh, you could possibly phone in here that might be able to give us some insight into Mr. Burton. In fact, uh, she's just about the biggest damn Tim Burton fan that I know. Do you? Can you already guess who I mean? This is becoming a, a thing with this show. <laughs> prosecute, defend, prosecute, call Lexus Sisyphus. <laughs> Here, I, on Facebook, I just messaged you her phone number. All right, you might want to text her and say, hey, uh, you're about to get a phone call from uh, from the show. Pick up. We're not, we're not telemarketers. Yeah, ha- hang tight a sec. Hey, mine coming on a podcast for a minute to talk about Tim Burton. We'll we'll see if she's around. It's it's altogether possible she's going to be either working or just simply otherwise occupied. All right. Well, we're dialing. Call failed or was not answered. I'm gonna try that again. Uh, that, so, something. But okay, she just saw my oh. message. So let me let's see if she responds. Let's try it again. Be, because yeah, she she has an encyclopedic knowledge of Tim Burton movies. And while she does she doesn't she won't blindly defend him, but she can at least, you know, elucidate what his actual appeal is. So Goth kids like him. She has said, sure, talking Planet of the Apes, I said, Yep. Um, I am having a hard time calling her. Uh, I may ask her uh, to here, call in her. Here, hang, here, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to give her the uh, Blog Talk Radio number. Okay. And have her call in. Uh, hang on, let me go to my contacts. Uh, is three two three six five seven zero nine zero. One. Okay. Let's, uh, she should be calling in now that she's got it, hopefully, any moment. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, our surprise witness once again for the On Trial podcast, Miss Alexis Pena. How are you, Matt? <laughs> hey, always happy to interrupt an eye zombie marathon to talk about the second worst Tim Burton movie of all time. <laughs> well done. All right, Sean and I have a question. <laughs> I, I, Sean appear, and I, have a I question am all ears. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I've just spent an enormous amount of time raking this movie over the coals. It was, it was, it was easy. It was easy meat. It was a uh, low hanging fruit. As we all know, this movie is totally. terrible, but, it, but mm-hmm. it does bring up the question, why Tim Burton? What makes him so wonderful? Why does he, despite a shoddy track record of movies, and it is shoddy. I mean, 
more often than not, he produces beautiful looking films. This isn't one of them, but as far as plot structure and characterization, he's about, he's about 500 if I'm being generous. So why, with a record like that, do we love Tim Burton? Not me, I should be stopped. But I mean, the rest of it. <laughs> well, I agree Tim Burton has not produced a lot of wins. Uh, now, I will say some of his more recent movies, uh, like uh, Big Eyes. I really enjoyed Big Eyes. That was a welcome departure, but a lot of it stems from the love of his early work. When Burton first came out, he was making movies that no one had really ever seen or not in, not really seen out of a major company and produced in just produced the way they were. We take a look at his early movies like Edward Scissorhands, Beetlejuice. These were very bizarre, very different films that just were kind of new. It was it wasn't something we were used to, and it really struck a chord. Now, unfortunately, the problem is that Burton didn't evolve for the longest time. His movies just became very repetitive. I think this is the problem with what I believe is the number one worst Burton movie of all time, Alice in Wonderland. Yes, I will say on record, I think Alice in Wonderland was way worse than Planet of the Apes. Most really? Have you I get seen Planet through the look? Have you seen through the look? That was, Burton did not direct that. He didn't direct sure. that. That was directed uh, by you're the guy who did. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember actually who directed that. No, that was painful to sit through, but that is not Burton. <laughs> My daughter loved it. And I looked at her and I said, well, you're, you're five. It's fine. My my, no. my my standpoint I get, tends to be. I was gonna say my standpoint tends to be he would make he make a fine producer. Um, he with his kind of visual knack for things, obviously certain movies accepted. I think he'd be a great cinematographer or director of photography. Um, I just think he should never be allowed to write a script or direct again. Well, again, he's done some things in recent years that I like. I'm going to go ahead and say I adore his adaptation of Sweeney Todd. I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. And I honestly thought he was very unfairly robbed of a Best Director Award at the Oscars. I, I stand by that. But, um, again, it's a lot. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, a lot of his work did become a little too over-repetitive, and we caught on to the fact that he was repeating a lot, a lot of the same style. It's very much, uh, what's his name, Bo Welsh, production, dire- uh, production designer, uh, who also infamously directed that awful Cat in a Hat movie, when you oh. let a, as an example of when you let a style overtake the substance. However... Recent Burton movies have gone back on track. Big Eyes was really good. Uh, what was that? The, the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar, something like that. That was enjoyable. Not, you know, knock me down amazing, but good. And I think he's getting a little bit better. His more recent movies have pulled back the style. It's not so much the whole, oh, black and white, ooh, crazy spirals, ooh, funny angles or anything. He's pulling it back a little bit. And I think it is showing, and I think it's a sign that he's evolving and growing. Time will tell. He could fall back and make crap again, but I I think, yeah, he's on the right track to improving. Well, here's – okay, here's another question then. What do you think – if you were to look at everything, what would you say changed from the days of, oh, let's let's kind of draw a line from that divides the – say, Beetlejuice through Edward Scissorhands era and everything that came after that. And I'm not counting Nightmare Before Christmas because Henry Selleck directed that. Exactly. Burden produced that, but it was yeah. also based off a poem that Burden had written and illustrated. I remember reading that poem when I was a kid and I loved it. So, okay, so, I mean, what do you, what what changed? What what changed between between did he just did he just run out of good ideas or I'm going on a hypothesis here. I have no proof to back this up whatsoever, but this is a theory. 
I think that as Burton got older, he tried to cling to what had originally made him famous. He started off as a very, very young animator for Disney uh, before getting his chops as a director. You know, I always like to point out um, uh, Frankenweenie, which he had originally done as a a live-action short for Disney, and it never really got a huge release. And then you look at his other uh, short film, Vincent, that was, I think that was done in the 80s, which is an amazingly awesome stop-motion film. Well, short. But I believe as he got older, he tried to cling a little bit too hard to what had made him so popular. I believe that he's kind of woken up and realized that he can't keep repeating what he had done in the past. You know, that he he had to evolve. He had to try new things. I think he is accepting the fact that, you know, the world has changed. He is older. And he just needs to keep, and he can't keep doing what he was doing. It's kind of a similar idea with uh, M. Night Shyamalan, if you think about it. He tried clinging way too hard to what had made him popular with his earlier films, Sixth Sense and Unbreakable. But his last two films were really well done, very critically acclaimed, because he's trying something well, new, and he is not standing by, he's not sticking to what just originally made him popular. I want to pitch an idea. Here's my, here's my, and I want, Alexis, I want you to judge, you know, what you think about this. I don't know how well you follow the film industry in terms of, you know, producing and financing and all of that. But here's what I think happened. I think, um, I think he made a couple of movies in the beginning that looked great and did well, and he guarded himself a reputation for an inventive and uh, you know inspirational director. And I think that he could sort of write his own ticket. And for years he did. You know, if you said if you put the name Tim Burton on something, you were guaranteed to get at least. A, a certain audience uh, to go mm-hmm. come see the film, and so a lot of studios were like, yeah, let's you know, Tim Tim Burton is the it director. He he is he's the he is the one we want, and he was given chance after chance after chance, and there were some successes and there were some failures to where the length of time that he could write his own ticket went on far longer than it should have. But during this time, because he's Tim Burton and he's an artiste the studios just stayed the hell out of his way with the exception of the Superman lives movie. Um, and, <laughs> when <they> started, <laughs> and when there started to be more failures than successes, the studio started to say, no, 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 no. We are not giving you free reign anymore. We are not going to invest millions and millions of dollars in you just so you, you know, just so uh, the film can bomb and we can lose all this money. And then I think, with adult supervision and some maturity, I think he started to pull himself out of the gutter. That's I, what I think is the story of Tim Burton. I think that's a pretty good theory. I also know that his more recent films actually bear a very strong similarity to one of his earlier films and what is, in my opinion, one of the best Tim Burton films, Ed Wood. Ed Wood is fantastic. And, yeah. Side you know, note: it, Rest in peace, Martin Landau. You will be missed. You know, it, Johnny Depp is definitely Johnny Depping on screen, but it's one of those it's one of those places where it actually fits, and it doesn't seem out of place, and he doesn't. I don't feel like he's chewing the scenery too much. Uh, but mm-hmm. a lot of these, like, you know, it, with the with the Alice in Wonderland and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and some of these other ones that he's done with Depp, it's like, was anyone watching? Was anyone paying any attention to what was happening here? See, I actually like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but I didn't like it too much for the Burton-esque, although I will say the design of the, uh, the chocolate room was so well done, and I really did like that. But it was more so that it was so much more loyal to the original book. Uh, Sean will tell you well, in the heartbeat that I'm a giant Roald Dahl fan. I grew up with his books. He was my favorite yeah. author as a kid. And I was so happy because as much as a lot of people like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, and I do enjoy it, I, it took so many liberties from the book. And when I saw Charlie and Chocolate Factory, I'm like, yes, that's what happened in the book. That is correct. That is accurate. 
you know, hell, I was even thrilled that they got the original songs in. I was ecstatic about that. Yes, but is it a good movie? I think it is, but it plays more to someone like me who not only enjoys the Tim, the Tim Burton style, but is a giant Roald Dahl <laughs> fan and wanted something loyal to the book. So I'm kind of well, biased. We'll have to, I, I you know, I, I see a role for you, Alexis. I, I don't know if you'll, <laughs> I don't know if you'll, if you'll do it, but I see a role for you on this show. We, we, I, I often begin the show with the uh, all rise. The court is now in session. The honorable judge Fudd presiding. So there's no real judge. I'm making a joke. But I, I, I'm starting to see a role for you here. <laughs> you know, I, I think you might have to be the judge of these uh, on trial podcasts and. You know, we we may have to do at some point Charlie and the talk to, talk with Factory, just so I can make the argument to you that this thing is a pile of trash. <laughs> well, for the record, we we'll be talking you, about that. I want to. I will be happy to come back in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not saying you have to judge every single one of these because that's a lot to ask. I know you're a busy woman, but I think on occasion we might have to bring on a special guest judge. Uh, Alexis is this, 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 this up. Um, and I can implore you with some of my cockamamie defenses and, uh, and, and on-point prosecutions. Uh, Sean, is there anything else you would like to address here with our, uh, our dear guest? In terms of the movie, um, not really. Uh, thank you for coming on because I've... Uh, at a certain point, uh, I am Chris Griffin walking out of No Way Out and going, how does he keep getting work? <laughs> when it people, uh, Kevin Costner not being one of them. Costner actually has some good movies. Um, but, Tim, but Tim Burton, no. I, I mean, I, I'm clearly not his demographic, I guess. But past a certain point, I, I just look and go, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> you know what's funny with the, re- with the remake of Planet of the Apes? Honestly, I- I've seen it a couple of times. And I think it could have been a good movie if they had actually gotten an ending that makes sense. Because I'm sorry. It, that, could it, that I... good... it, it could have been a good movie if they had gone with the Oliver Stone biblical conspiracy time travel idea. <laughs> well, I baseball. was gonna, gonna say the other, say the other reason I make it my second worst Tim Burton film, not my first, is that I give the film a lot of credit for the absolutely amazing makeup and set design. I I, I don't know if that oh, was Rick see. Baker's team who did that or not, but the, the Rick Baker got the Bachelor Award. Rick Baker got the Bachelor Award for the costume design, but you missed my entire first argument, which mostly centered on this movie looks like trash. Oh, yeah, because, we, we, well, we kind of we, we kind of made the argument that with it being Tim Burton, we were at least hoping that he would not fuck up Monkey Planet, <laughs> and he somehow managed, and he somehow managed to fuck up Monkey Planet. So I'm alone in thinking the makeup and set designs look amazing. No, you're right. Um, thinking the makeup is amazing. Half half right. I still think the gorilla looked terrible. They look like they were. <laughs> they, they look like they they ran to the nearest store to buy gorilla suits. The Michael Clark Duncan gorilla. Yeah, the, the they, best they of the do bunch. look like they, they, they do look like they basically cloned the Phoenix Suns mascot. <laughs> okay, fine. So the one gorilla, the Michael Clark Duncan gorilla, you guys say look like crap. But what about the rest? I mean, hell, I thought Tim Roth and Helena Bonham Carter's makeup looked great. Oh, I, I, I said that. I said Tim Roth looks the Tim Roth looks the best of that in the entire movie. No question there. Elena Bottom Carter also looks really good. You just can't understand a fucking word she says. Um, most of, yeah, actually, that's most a of good the point. Rest... Why do the characters? I say, why do the characters mumble half their words? I mean, did, did, were the masks just that hard to speak in or something? I I, I don't know. 
I do know that they all had to go to monkey school to learn how to walk, and maybe they all had to learn how to talk to these monkeys. I, I, don't, I don't understand what's happening in this movie, and I've said that at least three times now in the podcast. Um, M- MST3, yeah. MST3K had a more intelligible talking ape than this movie. When you have been out-enunciated by Professor Bobo, you have lost. I, uh, you, look, so our opinions of set design could be very subjective here. I just thought it looked very I, – I think I have two issues with it um, and 50 words or less. I expected more, and what I got – look like any director could have come up with this. So maybe calling this pile of trash um, might be a little on the harsh side, but when you get the spectacle that is Alice in Wonderland or um, a, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, TV's Big Adventure, Batman, and then you're just given this beige, earth-toned, jungly-looking thing, and it's like, you could have done so much more. You, you, you know, you had car blonde to go into your imagination and create a wild-looking, amazing, jumping-off-the-screen monkey world. And you just kind of gave us the background of any zoo. I was like, oh, well, that's disappointing. At least those practical sets are not CGI. Well, thank you for not being George Lucas, <laughs> Tim Burton. No, that's thank you for not thank you for not being Alice in Wonderland. Oh wait. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, seriously, that that's actually my the, one of the things I hate most about Alice in Wonderland was that it's pretty much like it's an it's a green screen. I'm watching a fucking green screen this entire movie. Aw, not all green screens are bad. I think you know they they use. They used some green screen effect in green screen. They used green screen effect in The Hobbit, and most of that looked fine. No, I, I have nothing against CGI, and I have nothing against green screens. I just hate it when I'm watching a movie, and it becomes abundantly clear that the entire thing was shot on a green screen, and there was very theological practical effects. I, I hate that. Okay. You're, you're allowed. I'll allow it. <laughs> Um, okay. I think, uh, I think we're about ready to wrap here. Sean, I'm going to let you, uh, since you brought our, our beloved guest on here, I'm going to let you have the last word with her before we uh, close out. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on. I certainly appreciate it when we have you there to turn to when neither of us necessarily has the clearest idea what we're talking about. Um, or at the very least when you know something that we don't, um, so I'll say this. Do you have uh, anything you'd maybe like to plug on the way out? Could you have said that any more smarmy? I was trying I was trying to be half ass wink winkish about it. That wasn't half ass wink winkish. That was wink comma wink exclamation point exclamation point. And just but like yeah, that, that is gone. Did it? And did yes, it, actually, wait, we do have did something. It, did it sound like this? No, we do have something. Wah 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 wah. Oh, it's a living, <laughs> huh? You know. Wah wah. Wah 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 wah. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Hang on, wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it sounded more like that's that great, great, wink, wink, nuts, nuts, saying them all. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cut off your plug. Please continue. <laughs> sorry, Monty Python had to have the final word there. No, uh, in honor of this weekend with San Diego Comic Con, which sadly, Honeysuckle Rose Creations, my company, is not attending this year. Uh, we are still hosting one of our biggest online sales uh, this weekend for the duration of the Comic Con. Some of our best and most popular items are 25% off. We've essentially plugged that anything that's going to be talked about at Comic-Con is on sale. So anything Marvel-related, anything Star Wars-related, anything um, Deadpool-related, anything DC-related, all of that is 25% off on my Etsy and handmade at Amazon stores. Again, 
Honeysuckle Rose Creations. Okay. Thank you once again for being a part of this. Uh, we will we will have to plan something with you in the future. Um, you know, we 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 can talk offline about that. Okay, uh, thank you, Sean. No problem. Uh, always a pleasure. Sean, you want to go ahead and plug whatever it is you're doing these days? Okay. Well, as I always say, thank you to everybody who listens live, downloads, everybody who likes the show and tells a friend, or who hates the show and tells someone whose guts they hate. Um, we appreciate it thoroughly. Entertaining and informing all of you is the reason why we take time out of our busy weeks to do this, and we hope to keep doing that for a long, 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 long time. Uh, thank you, as always, to the inimitable Jesse Starcher for that wonderful voiceover and opening theme that he cobbled together for us. Uh, we don't say that to him nearly enough. Uh, be sure to check him out regularly on the Source Material Comics podcast and also on Screaming Boy Productions. Um, uh, let's see here. Other various and sundry plugs. I really don't have anything of my own to plug right now. I'm kind of taking it easy to work on some personal projects. Um, so I will just say that if you want to chat about the show or anything else in particular, feel free to find me on Twitter at Comer Codex, C-O-M-E-R-C-O-D-E-X. Uh, I'm on there pretty much most times during the day. I've got it open on my laptop, so I can always answer anything that I get, be it a DM, tweet, retweet, anything of the kind. Thank you once more to Alexis for taking the spontaneous time to drop by and offer her insight. And I will just tell everybody, be excellent to each other. Remember that $20 can buy many peanuts. And also, as always, never dull your colors for someone else's a canvas. All right, so the Rattledgen Broadcasting Network goes apeshit, uh, comes to a relative close next week. We got a brand new bag of themes. Uh, it's all military all the time here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network. Uh, we'll have on source material Sergeant Rock between Hell and a Hard Place. Uh, Andrew Graham, super fan of the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network, will join Damn You Hollywood on Tuesday, and we're going to review Dunkirk. The Metal Hammer of Doom will be reviewing the new In This Moment album, much to Robert Cooper's chagrin. And then uh, Andrew Graham and his wife, because according to my daughter, I don't have enough women on the network. So uh, this is one of those rare moments (laughs) when we will. Uh, Andrew Graham and his wife will join me for a TV party tonight. We're going to look at the Netflix miniseries Five Came Back. So that's what we got going on. Um, As far as the next on trial, that's going to be August 3rd. And that's going to be part of Charlize Theron Week. Yes, we have an entire week dedicated to Charlize Theron, because why the hell not? Um, Source material is going to look at The Coldest City, uh, which you might know as the movie Atomic Blonde, which we will review the next day on Damn You Hollywood. Uh, Metal Hammer of Doom will review Unleash the Archers, Apex. And then On Trial, uh, as I said, is back with the 2003 version of The Italian Job. Why the Italian job, you ask? Because Charlize Theron is in it, and I'm not that creative. Aha! All right. Uh, I, with that said... I, well, consider me, a bit, consider me a bit surprised we didn't do Eon Flux. I would rather poke out my eyes as this. Um, <laughs> Damn. Wait, wait, wait. wait. H- h- hang on. Is that by chance on Netflix? I hang don't on know. A second. I haven't looked. Well, I'm looking right now. I happen to have my laptop open. Okay. <laughs> Eon. Oh, 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 you are so lucky that's not available. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. Dodge the bullet there. Um, <laughs> so... That's all for now, folks. Uh, for Sean Comer, for Alexis... Pena... Court is now out of session. All rise once again as the jo- as the honorable judge Fudge leaves the court. I don't know how this is 
supposed to go. I'm tired. I'm sorry. Be well, be <laughs> safe, and behave.